So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Sabine Hildebrand. Sabine is Associate Professor of Pediatrics. She is a physician, but I, I think her world in depth right now is in anatomy, but she could tell us a little bit. And she's in the Division of General Pediatrics, which of course we have a large division at Northwell, as well as the Department of Pediatrics at Boston's Children's Hospital, one of the premier um, children's hospitals in the country, but we do have our own children's hospital, Cone Children's Medical Center, that we're really proud of. And she's also involved in global health and social medicine at Harvard, which are areas that we value global health a lot. And then we have Robert Hill here as a discussant. Um, Dr. Hill is at the um, Zucker School of Medicine full-time as an anatomist. And he's been an anatomist for many years and very involved in our innovative, creative, integrated curriculum. And he's director of the Structure Lab. We call it Structure. I always have to say AKA anatomy, but Structure. And the Structure Lab involves, of course, anatomy, imaging, um, histopathology. Did I forget something, Rob? Histopath, imaging, anatomy, and embryology. And embryology. I knew I forgot something, embryology. So it's a combined curriculum, and Dr. Hill is director of that. He's also director of our anatomical gift program, which is interesting because we will be discussing um, the balance of anatomical gift with, of course, um, images for anatomy. And that's what some schools are doing. Um, and I have definitely seen this in the Caribbean where I've done some consultation. So I'm really thrilled. I see a lot of wonderful people on this call and some people I don't know. So I look forward to a great discussion and I'm going to turn it over to Sabine to further introduce herself if she likes with anything I didn't say, as well as, you know, share her screen. And I will be managing the chat. And every time we ask a question, we really, really hope people participate. And Dr. Hill will be facilitating and making sure we have some discussion. So thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure. And I'm gonna say this is the inauguration of the 10th year of the Medical Education Journal Club that we've been offering at Zucker School of Medicine and Hofstra Northwell. Thank you. Thank you so much for this introduction, Dr. Fanari. I feel honored to uh, start off this 10th year of your Journal Club. And what I'll be discussing with you today are some really preliminary thoughts on the role of uh, artificial intelligence in the world of anatomy and specifically anatomical imaging. And uh, as also Dr. Fanari just indicated, I'm actually not a uh, practicing physician. I'm just trained as a physician, but my world is in anatomy and specifically my research uh, focus is on history and ethics of anatomy. And that will come through uh, in my presentations and in the discussion we will have. I should also like to say that many of the thoughts that I'm presenting here today are based on the work that I've been developing in later in the later um, the recent years, really, with my colleagues Tom Champney, who's on the call here, and John Cornwell from the University of Otago, Tom Champney at the University of Miami. And we are known as the so-called bioethics unicorns in anatomy. And our interest group friends are some of the people on the call here today. And uh, I understand that we always start off these uh, journal clubs with a question. And the question we have for you to think about and to start also discussing here before I launch into any uh, presentation, are uh, how did you learn anatomy? Was ethics ever discussed as part of your anatomy education? And if so, what were the specific considerations? So everybody on this call has taken anatomy. So I hope, or some of you, I should say. And I know that we uh, we have on this call, um, uh, you know, some of my current coworkers on the structure team at the Zucker School of Medicine. We have physicians from Northwell Health, and then we have anatomists who I studied with and I go back uh, 25 years with. So I know the answer to some of these questions, but I, I can just start saying that I learned anatomy in what could be called a very traditional way. Um, it involved pretty much dissection of all parts of the body and lectures to supplement that. 
but ethics was not really explicitly made part of that anatomy education. I remember distinctly being in the in the anatomy lab. We didn't have a structure lab then, but the anatomy lab um, uh, involved really looking at the donor body as uh, as a cadaver, as a specimen to be studied. And um, we didn't really think very much about, you know, what they what they were like as a person uh, before they died. And I thought at the time that this was a very important tool to have uh, in my toolbox, that that idea of kind of clinical detachment and being able to separate the science from the once living person. I've definitely evolved on that thought over the past couple of decades, and I imagine some of you have, too. I might call on you, Karen. What happened? I was going to say, I can echo pretty much my experience was almost the same exact. You went, did you go to Downstate? I went to Downstate. I learned anatomy in the anatomy lab in the basement with donor <laughs> cadavers um, uh, with some supplemental lectures as well. And definitely there wasn't any discussion regarding ethics. There was a once a year kind of ceremony to really uh, say thank you to the donor's families, uh, you know, for the donation. Um, and that that was it, really. I don't even I, I think actually at Downstate for the for the donors, um, some of the many of them actually, I think people didn't even know, uh, like where they came from, their background, so on and so forth. It was it was never even mentioned. You brought up the, you said the ceremony. Did I get your words right? Yeah. You know, when I got to Einstein Medical School, I was brand new to med ed because uh, this is my second career. And when I got to Einstein Medical School, one day I saw this announcement for this ceremony to honor the cadavers. Most people know um, I'm like a spiritual person. I love the humanities. I don't know. I said, what is this thing? You know, it was like four o'clock on an afternoon. It was outside under a tree. Now I'm in the Bronx. There's not that many trees, but it was outside under a tree. And I go to this ceremony and I'm like, Oh my God, well, my one child had finished medical school at that point and I never heard of this. And I was like, what is this? Is this what every medical school does? It's so special at Einstein. And then of course I learned more about these ceremonies. And of course we have one at Zucker and that sort of, to me, it's, it's recognizing the specialness of anatomy in the role of medical education and you know, what are the ethical considerations I think are important. So Haley, I'm going to let you say something. Thank you very much. So I'm Haley. I am currently sat next door to uh, Dr. Schlegel over in the, in the Bahamas. Um, I learned anatomy in the, in the UK. Um, in my undergraduate, we did uh, lots of dissection, but it was never really covered um kind of the the ethical parts or the the background information um but then when i went on to my first job post uh post graduation um i worked in a medical school and we incorporated um the the kind of the ethical uh i was going to say procedures so the things that the guidelines and the laws that we had to abide by into the initial induction of the students. And then we also encouraged uh, families, if they wanted to, to give uh, a little bit of background about the donors that we had so that they were still anonymized, um, but it could be that, you know, the, the students went to have a look at uh, the person, uh, a little bit of background about the person, why they chose to donate um, and made it a little bit more uh, kind of, human and uh, would, would say living, but that's probably not the best best term to use. Thank you. Um, I saw another hand up. Did I miss it? I'm, I'm not seeing everybody. Could somebody speak out if somebody else had a hand up or not? Or are we okay? Jeremy put something in the chat. I box. thought Alyssa, did you have a hand up at one point? No, I'm sorry. No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, sorry, I'm just guessing. Jeremy, guess. go ahead. No, I was just gonna pick up on what Karen said. Yeah, Jeremy, maybe you wanna... Um, yeah, no, it's uh, similar to what other people have said. Like they may have included ethics in my 
curriculum and classes, but I do not remember that, which I think speaks to um, the power or the uh, prioritization of that part of the curriculum. It was a very standard kind of anatomy course that I went through with lots of lecture, you know, lots of cad cadaver based dissection and the humanization and, and acknowledging that this was a person was very much minimized during the experience. Thank you for contributing. And what, um, and Thomas, you have something? I'm old. Okay, you could start with I'm old. That's okay. Yep, just, you can read what it says there, but, uh, you know, we, uh, the bodies we used in Texas, we weren't sure if they were donors or unclaimed. We were never told where the donors came from, where the bodies came from. And we were told to think of them as pieces of wood. That, that, that the life and the thing that was gone, uh, that was, that made that person was gone and that we should just, you know, think of them as things to use, kind of pieces of wood to work on and not be concerned about the humanity of those individuals. Wow. Thank you. Um, well, you I have a lot to say it for somebody who's old, so I appreciate you contributing. <laughs> Tom, I haven't heard you share that uh, perspective before, but it, but it's interesting, I think, and, and, um, uh, maybe for the thrust of Sabine's uh, presentation, you know, as we're embarking on a time when, in a way, we're being asked to think about the bodies as ones and zeros. And, you know, if there's an artificial intelligence uh, overlay to how we learn anatomy, are we going, we're going back to, uh, is this the wood of the future? Well, I think that's my cue, uh, Rob, isn't it? Uh, to launch in some of the thoughts that we have developed late, lately, uh, and that includes Tom Champney, the man who learned about anatomy uh, and the body being wood. Uh, we certainly have come a long way. And I think some of that we already heard in the contributions just now, that there is a picture of a traditional anatomy education that saw the human body as body parts, or even as uh, Tom just said, pieces of wood. Um, but what we can also describe now, and this is from a, a paper that uh, uh, Tom, John, and I have just uh, in print in uh, academic medicine, what we can describe is a development over the last two decades or so of a new ethos in uh, anatomy. We propose that the traditional anatomy education of the past that sees the body only as parts had been transformed under the influence of reduced curricular time and changes in the structure for anatomy learning, such as the um, integrated curricula we heard about, together with uh, new pedagogies and changes in social mores, have now uh, uh, developed into what we call a new relational model of anatomy education, in which the body has a role of patient and or teacher. Indeed, the implicit, unacknowledged nature of the role of professional identity formation in the past anatomy courses allowed for an uncritical adoption of prevailing professional values, which included a strict hierarchy in medical practice and a paternalistic understanding of doctor-patient relationships. What we believe is that the explicit acknowledgement of the processes involved in professional identity formation and the illumination of non-technical skills that we can learn and acquire in the anatomy labs are essential for enabling the full potential of the new ethos in anatomy education, allowing for ethical reasoning and for the practice of healing in patient care. This figure describes this dynamic network of relationships in anatomy education, where we have the, the student learner or trainee, the patient teacher or the anatomical donor, and the educator or preceptor. Anatomy as the first clinical discipline, essentially, with the cornerstone of ethics here being the body procurement by ethical means. Note how this relationship strengthens numerous non-anatomical components, such as professional identity formation and ethical learning. Many of these traits are developed through the connections in the dissection room, fostering this new ethos of anatomy education. And based on this relational model, we can look at the various actors in this model and can now 
investigate the proposed roles for artificial intelligence models in anatomy education. And these are all uh, roles that have been proposed in various pieces of literature that have been um, published so far, and I'm sure many more will be in the works. For educators, such models can support curriculum development and possibly aid in cross-section work that's currently under investigation. Models that conduct student assessment by exam grading have already been successfully employed, for example, by our colleagues to the north, um, by our Canadian colleague Bruce Wayman and his team. And such models have also been discussed for, for the assessment of students' emotional status, for example, by text analysis of their reflective writing. In terms of the role of students in all of this, AI models can serve in tutoring in anatomy and uh, tutoring in the learning of interpreting imaging techniques. They can support individualized knowledge acquisition and in this role can possibly even replace the anatomy educator for the student. And then in terms of the body donors themselves, it has been suggested that AI models could replace the physical human bodies completely, just as Bob had just indicated, that the bodies become not just dead wood, but uh, basically numbers, a uh, series of zeros and ones. And what I'll be most uh, uh, concerned with today is actually the role that has been proposed for AI models in the creation of new anatomical images and representations. These are the papers that you have looked at. And we should say, apart from the fact that we have ethical concerns for the various models in anatomy education, particularly in anatomical images, there are also proposed advantages of AI models in these fields, particularly cost and time efficiency and supposedly accuracy. In this context, the ethical questions that come to mind or the problems in general that come to mind with AI concern ethical and legal considerations. Then the question of the validity of the images, and that especially goes to the fact that, that there is a claimed accuracy or greater accuracy to AI models. And then there are problems with the role of medical illustrator that is supposedly replaced by AI models. Starting with the ethical and legal considerations, the main problem here really is the question of data sources. Uh, where is the copyright for the data that are being used to create these images? Was it gained uh, properly? Was it gained, uh, gained improperly? Was it gained at all? Um, then there is the question of the acquisition of original images from context of injustice. And of course, the problem of a perpetuation of historic biases in anatomical um, context. Question, I can, I can answer. Yeah. Is there a question? Yeah. Not yet. Okay. So concerning the data sources, we have to ask the question, where do anatomical images come from anyhow? And what criteria made them quote unquote good images in their time. And this is just a five minute run through the history of anatomical imaging, really just outlining some of the criteria that have been um, important for the uh, value of anat anatomical imaging in the part, past. Of course, at first, there were no images about words that describe the anatomy of the human being. Uh, when we look at the works of Galen, for example, in second era, uh, second century of Common Era, we uh, will see that these are volumes and volumes of words with no depiction whatsoever. We do see the earliest depictions coming up here with examples from the 14th century Common Era, from Persia and Asia, and these are more maps rather than accurate depictions of human anatomy. Um, the criteria were here, actually, the subject at that time wasn't even human, uh, because human dissection had only been allowed um, in the in the 34th century before Common Era in Alexandria, and that not, then not again until the early Renaissance in Europe. 
Um, but these were animal dissections. The content was a documentation of the observations of these dissections, and more or less it was important to show the concepts, uh, less so the recognizable anatomical accurate depiction of these images, at least from today's point of view. The technique relied on hand drawing of images, and thus there were only few copies, if any. And uh, the aesthetic was probably based on beauty, if we look here, for example, at the symmetry and coloring of these hand drawings. Now, big step forward into the 15th to 17th century, when uh, starting with Renaissance in Europe, we see images true to nature from maps. We go to anatomy art when you think of uh, Da Vinci, for example, but also here in the example of Andreas Vesalius. The subject was the human being not an animal, but a human being. Uh, and these human beings were sourced from the unclaimed, that is uh, persons whose body, uh, who died in public institutions and weren't claimed for burials by their family, or they were human beings robbed from graves uh, or so-called executed criminals. The content was a documentation of the exact and recognizable depiction of uh, dissections uh, the technique was black and white prints with possibly some hand coloring. And the aesthetic was that these needed to be true to nature, but usually in the background of beauty, as the landscape you see here in the Andreas Vesalius uh, image. The distribution was multiple. These were printed already. Book printing was invented, but it was highly costly, so there was no mass production. And the images were often copied because even the creation of the images was expensive. Now we go into the 18th century into the more scientific mode of anatomical um, work. We see that the accuracy of the anatomical detail goes into the focus of the good anatomical image to the point that uh, Scottish um, anatomist Charles Bell created his own artwork to ensure scientific accuracy. Um, subject remained uh, usually the unclaimed human or uh, the uh, those robbed from graves and the executed. Mm. Uh, the content was intricate observations of dissections. The technique remained mostly black and white prints with the first color prints appearing and the aesthetic was still focused on the exact and detailed anatomy alone with no extraneous, and this is important, no extraneous visual information. It was the anatomical detail, the, so the complete detachment here that we see here at the center. Uh, and again, these uh, prints were still very costly. This only changed then really in the late 19th and early 20th century, when we now have the first atlases created for educational purposes, here we have Gray's Anatomy on the left side and Johannes Sobota, a German atlas on the right side. Um, they are, were specifically made for students. Um, they focus on the human, usually unclaimed, um, also in all places other than the UK and the Commonwealth, there were still executed people among those that were depicted in the images. Um, the content uh, is focused on intricate observations of various layers of dissection, however, with a focus on showing only the pedagogically most important structures and actually emphasizing these pedagogically important uh, structures. The technique now uses colorized prints, and we have a multiple distribution of affordable books for students that were often copied. And then we get into that very special uh, time of the Nazi era and the Austrian Eduard Kernkopf and the atlas that he created um, starting before the Nazi era and or, uh, in Austria and uh, finishing afterwards. Um, he, Eduard Kernkopf, as well as his illustrators, including Erich Lepi, were uh, Nazi affiliates. Um, this topographical anatomy of man became enormously popular among surgeons and anatomists, also among students, but really mostly among clinicians because it showed the body layer by layer that had been, quote unquote, invented uh, before this particular gaze of the clinician, but it was brought to perfection by Helmkopf. Uh, 
The problem here really is that the subjects he depicted, especially during the war years, were not only unclaimed bodies, but also the uh, bodies of victims of the Nazi regime, uh, very often executed uh, uh, resistance fighters against the Nazi regime. And so we uh, have uh, many of these um, bodies in these images. We don't know exactly which ones show uh, the victims, but we do know that they are among the images shown in the book. These are intricate observations of the various layers of dissection. Uh, then a new printing technique shows these brilliant images here in four color prints. And we see a combination of anatomical detail with a pedagogical approach and colorful topographical place of clinical relevance. And this again is an atlas that was affordable for students and that keeps on being copied to this day. This here is just one of the signs of the Nazi uh, sympathies here, Erich Lepke signed with a swastika. This is from an original of the atlas. Again, the problem with these images that they are already being copied. These Prankop images here is an original, and here is a modern copy from a Sobota edition from uh, 2019. Uh, in, in work to, uh, developed together with Claudia Krebs, uh, anatomy professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. We have looked at these copies and found that, uh, that medical illustrators actually do not have to quote the source of the images that they copied. And Claudia Krebs, uh, Krebs can show that this image here in the Zobata Atlas is an actually a tracing. It's not just a copy, it's a tracing of the Pernkopf original, but nowhere in this edition of the Sopote Atlas did it say that the original was a Pernkopf image. When I visited the publisher of the Sopote Atlases in, um, in uh, 2019, the publisher is Elsevier, um, uh, they were not aware of this history. They are also the publishers of the Sobota Atlas. And when I spoke to them, they agreed that the, the new editions of the Sobota Atlas need to have an introductory information on the origin of the some of the images in the Sobota Atlas from the Pernkopf Atlas. And so we have now included here a new historical critical introduction to the latest edition of the Soboda Atlas. So you see that we already have these problems with the sourcing of data in atlases, even before we even go to artificial intelligence models. Um, again, not even artificial intelligence models, even just with our online teaching materials, the applications that we use, we have to ask where do the images and data come from? Where does the knowledge come from? And many of you have used, especially since the pandemic, these online resources of images. And here we have to ask, what are the criteria here? The subjects here are actually human data sets. So we're already into human data sets. Most of these companies uh, use uh, available data sets uh, and uh, their, the renderings that they give are often not anatomically correct because most of these companies do not employ anatomy content experts. They basically just copy from something and some of the copies are quite uh, incorrect. The technique is 2D and 3D images uh, that is customizable for the educator and student. Uh, sometimes these also include virtual reality modalities. And the aesthetics very often is the prevalence of for car cartoon-like reductions of visual information. So uh, for ma basically making things better visible for students, the amount of visual information is reduced, reduced towards a cartoon. And the distribution, of course, is multiple, and these apps are highly affordable for all of us, including our students. The problem with the data sets is that, uh, again, we have here data sets included that I would consider ethically problematical. One of them is the male data set from the Visible Human Project that the National Library of Medicine created in the 1990s. This male data set uh, uh, hails from a man called Joseph Paul Jernigan, who was executed for murder on August 5th, 1993 in Texas. 
supposedly he had donated his body on death row. And if you have problems, ethical questions, at least uh, in terms of capital punishment, ethical questions about work with vulnerable populations, such as prisoners, and ethical questions, or maybe philosophical questions, really, about free will on death row, then you should at least be informed about the fact that this data set is included here. And that brings us now to our next question of problems with uh, AI and anatomical images creation. And that is the vid validity of the images. Are they reality or are they hallucinations? And hallucinations, I use here the Oxford Dictionary definition as an experience of involving the apparent perception of something not present. And I show you here an example from the work of Patrick Penefather, who's a medical illustrator at the University of British Columbia. He works with the AI independent research lab model Midjourney, and he prompted this model to create a anatomically precise prosection of the brain used in medical research. Now, you don't even have to know neuroanatomy to understand that this, uh, uh, this brain depiction here has nothing to do with the real human brain and cannot really be used in neuroanatomy. Furthermore, what do we do in the future? Is this the future of anatomical images here in this image that has nothing to do with anatomy, but that shows uh, a problem with the general data sets available to um, uh, AI models such as this Google chatbot. It had been, and this is an example that went through the press earlier this year, it had been prompted to create an image of a 1943 German soldier. Now, have a look at these soldiers and consider the fact who the Nazis were and who their soldiers were. Clearly this model, this chatbot had learned to be politically correct and inclusive, but it also as clearly had absolutely no insight into historical context and the reality of Nazi Germany's eliminatory anti-Semitism and racism. The lack of history knowledge is one of the many causes of visual and text hallucinations created by AI models so far. And so I call for literacy in history, including in our field of anatomy. And finally, what will the role of the medical illustrator be in the context of AI generated imagery? What will be the illustrator's creativity, didactics, innovation, and collaboration which has already changed the landscape of anatomical images. As you recall, there have been now long discussions in the new millennium about the conventional Eurocentric white and male gaze and the image of the human body uh, that should be replaced by inclusive in anatomical representation of the multitude of forms based on voluntary participation of the humans depicted. And actually this year, was the uh, original meta image of surface anatomy of the head, of the head uh, um, presumably depicting, or I was told this was Dr. Netta himself in, in young years. And this had already been replaced by new atlases, the, uh, the example by Moses Banks, Navan Peterson. Uh, and then uh, the Netta team itself has now actually, oops, uh, I'm sorry. Here we go, as the NETA team has replaced the older image in its latest edition with a, a more uh, inclusive image uh, of, in this case, a woman. Our anatomy colleagues from Black and Anatomy and many others are now active in this area of innovating anatomical representation. That's again, it's just one example of the many teams that are currently working on new representations and the American Association of Anatomy has given funds to the so-called pop art project that creates these new images with no criteria for good anatomical images. By the way, the first examples of this pop art team uh, effort will come out later this year on the AAA website. 
The new criteria for the good anatomical images have to be inclusive and diverse and, and uh, derived from volunteer human beings. They need to be accurate representations of anatomy that are historically aware. They include 2D and possibly also 3D models. The aesthetic needs to be focused on the shared human anatomy in its variable forms. And the distribution needs to be accessible to all. And it needs to be created in collaboration between the illustrator, the anatomist, and the human being depicted. And I will end with this thought. A good anatomy image today should be anatomically correct and ethically, or at a minimum, transparently sourced and offer inclusive representations. And one question for you. How do you think the replacement of body donors by AI models would affect the learner? Sabina, of all the um, potential problems that you highlighted with AI, I, th I think the, the one that um, troubles me the most is the validity of images. I think AI, you know, including things like chat GPT, but also these generative um, image AIs, uh, they all kind of sell the notion that there's a quick, easy, um, and black and white answer to your prompt. So if you say, give me a uh, accurate depiction of the brain, it will churn out something and never look back. And that's, uh, those images, you know, stand to get better and better and be potentially accurate but there's still just one image and they're without context and they don't depict the, the sticky reality that um, anatomy is complicated and it's different from person to person. And as different as we look on the outside, um, that's how different we look on the inside. I see Mark has his hand up. Hey, Mark. Hey, Rob. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, Rob and I uh, go way back. Uh, we actually took anatomy uh, at Stony Brook and, and my first teaching 25 years ago was uh, with Rob Hill in the lab. So um, way, way pre- that against him. Yeah, yeah, don't hold that against me. Uh, way way pre-AI, right? We were like uh, just getting whiteboards at that time and we were coming off of chalk. But, you know, I, to follow up on what Rob Hill said, um, you know, I, one of the most beautiful things about the anatomy lab is with the cadavers is the variation, right? The anatomical variation and... And even when you see like a netter image and he's got like an artery that or a vein that's not going through, you know, it's going through the orbital canal or the optic canal instead of the superior orbital fissure, like that's what he saw on the table. You know, a lot of those drawings are the variations. And if it's an AI generated variation, that's just that's made up, right? We don't know if that's a reality or not, a real variation. But if it's on the cadaver, you know, when you see a three headed biceps brachii, that's real. And and I uh, was before I, I'm at Wasom University here with uh, some of my colleagues that spoke earlier, Haley Derricott and and Dr. Schlegel. But uh, I was at Lincoln Memorial before this, and me and the one of the other anatomy professors, we spent half of the lab going to around and finding the other professor to show them the latest variation that we saw that day. You know, the biggest pronator teres muscle you've ever seen in your life. You know, was this guy a mechanic or you know? So just. That is, I don't, I would have a hard time believing it, right? If it was artificially generated, it wouldn't tell me anything about the life history of that person or the genetic history. So um, that's, that's, that's what I would say is maybe a obvious limitation. I have a question, a quick question. Does the new criteria apply to AI that you put on the prior slide? I think that you mentioned, but you didn't have AI in your list that it applies to. So there are no criteria for AI generated um, images then if that is correct. Can you verify that? No, I mean, that would be a minimum uh, request for AI, those criteria that I formulated there. And as I, as I said, these are first thoughts on the subject. I'm not sure that anybody has developed uh, criteria for what AI should generate. Uh, at this point, we're we're, uh, we're starting just to to um, put together a list of all the problems that we see, right? 
uh, and uh, hopefully developing from that. But then I'm not involved in AI uh, image generation. I can see all the problems. <laughs> I'm not involved in actually creating these models. But somebody could take all those criteria and feed them into chat GPT. Has anybody done that? On not this call? Know of, no. Maybe Patrick Penefather, who's involved in this as a medical illustrator, I, may, uh, I, can, I can ask him if he started doing that. Stephanie, did you want to say something? I see you have in the chat. Sure. I was just um, reflecting on a conversation I had on my way to my office to attend this webinar where a student was completely confused and actually thought there might be a mistake with the teaching because of what ChatGPT told him. And <laughs> he just didn't realize that it's not the same as perhaps using a search engine for, um, you know, a respectable journal or something like that. And we talked about how it's only searching things that are freely available and there's no, yeah, basically we talked about the issues. Um, and I think what struck me is that he wasn't aware and like he, he, yeah, I got the impression that he would not have turned to that if he knew where the data were coming from. And um, so I'm just thinking doing a better job at educating the students about what chat GPT can be helpful for and image-based uh, generative AI and what we really have to be careful about. Just like, I think it's even worse with images, I guess. <laughs> I've seen some that, way interesting that stuff. Already, that already started with Wikipedia, if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> now it's like Wikipedia is much better because people have been editing it. So I'm like, well, I didn't think that would be the more credible source about something, but it is now. <laughs> so. Karen, did you want to add to something? I see yeah, you. What I was going to say was, I think we will get to a point in time where what AI actually produces will probably be extremely accurate. We're not there yet, but we will get there eventually. And I think the real bigger question is not the information that AI provides, but whether teaching anatomy with an actual cadaver versus images. And I think one of the things that's missing here is, you know, the whole process of doing anatomy lab and that whole indoctrination of becoming a physician is about professional identity formation and that whole socialization context. And I think that there's not been enough done yet at all. I, I think the pandemic was the first foray into like really moving things away from in-person kind of experiences to what that actually does in terms of like professional identity formation. Because anatomy is a big part of taking an average Joe person who decided they wanted to go to medical school and actually helping them to become a physician. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. This uh, journal club was just about the anatomical uh, imaging part. Um, when you go back, once our paper is published, we'll go in much detail into the professional identity formation. But we believe as when I say uh, we, it's, it's it's Tom uh, Champneys on the call and um, uh, John Cornwell and all our friends actually <laughs> believe very strongly, you're, you're preaching to the choir is what I'm trying to say. We believe very strongly that you need to work with a body donor. You know, it's interesting. Um, I think as educators, many of us value the body donors. I don't know if there's anybody on this call that would like to, you know, refute that from a different perspective. You know, to me, I'm a little traditional. I can't imagine not using the body donors. Bill, you've been around a really long time doing this work. Like, do you think you could ever adapt to not having a donor body? Uh, I totally agree with what uh, most people have said already. And that's that uh, there is a... Um, a personal and a professional connection that's made um, with the process uh, in the lab that is hardly achievable anywhere else. Um, perhaps in the operating room is the only other place that I can imagine that that really uh, creates uh, a physician's point of view and uh, demeanor. So, uh, so that part is certainly the 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 elephant in the in the front room that we're just uh, trying to avoid. As far as the images are concerned, um, we owe it to uh, 
ourselves and our students and and those who have um, made these invaluable human donations to give students the best uh, of all images with full disclosure and and images that actually um, depict the amazing variations that we find all the time because patients have those variations all the time. And uh, it only uh, serves their interests um, as well as ours to have that broad view and to have the view towards the, the most um, accurate and expanding view of each of these anatomical uh, structures because we learn more about them all the time and uh, that we owe that to our students and to the donors just as well. I'm just I'm just wondering with the images, do we have to teach students, since many of us are involved in students, how to create images using AI that will be accurate? Is that something we need to be teaching? Because they're going to be doing that? I'm not, you know, this is really a novice asking a question. Any thoughts on that? No, we are not experts in this. We have enough on our plates to just teach them the anatomy. But Mali has his hand up. You're muted, Mali. Um, I'm trying to see where that Mali has a technical issue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you can put it in the chat, we, we can read it out for you. Yeah, or we could write. Oh, or, oh or, or get the mic working. Right. Anybody else have any thoughts? I had a question about the human project. Um, go ahead. Do you want to take this on, Don, what N Nicholas said? Uh, Rob, what Nicholas said? Sure. So, um, uh, Nick, I don't know if you're, you're able to speak to elaborate, but... Um, a lot of effort in the images, uh, Nick says, will be eventually accurate and, and useful in teaching. Um, but your concern is around the ethics of the collection use of large volume of actual real human image data. Um, yeah, and so that was, the, I think, Sabine, the, the first of the uh, concerns that you mentioned there. Where, where do these data come from? Um, something that I know that many of the anatomists on the call are very sensitive to is, uh, are they consented data? Um, where they collect it in a way that gives the illusion of consent when they really haven't consented to their use in this way. I really like this statement below on his on Nicholas's comment. I mean, it hits me as a novice that um, this will many people's bodies images from the dissections may be used by training for profit models that will generate large income for companies without recognition or remuneration to the donors. Yep. Um, that yep. is a little scary. And that's a, a big discussion, uh, Alice, as again, as many of my colleagues on the call know, um, on the national level, uh, that has a, a, a tangible counterpart, which is the use of plastinated models. So plastinated models are um, generated from bodies that were consented for the use uh, you know, to be made into plastinated models, but then those models uh, can be sold at a profit. So, you know, is that something that the um, donating individual was had in mind or or was uh, consenting to? I see, Molly, you fixed your... Um, yes, can you guys hear me? Shoot. Welcome. All right, thank you. Thanks, Sabine. A uh, couple of uh, points with the AI. Uh, I think a uh, speaker earlier mentioned that AI will get accurate. And I am maybe a minority to believe that it will never be accurate uh, for the reason being there are always going to be variations and AI can never predict what variation is going to be. Like if, if we were to ask AI generate something with this variation, we wouldn't know if it's going to be accurate or not. Um, to, to your point about Sabine, should we train them? I, I believe we should train them. And, and I work with Steph. Uh, one of the other examples I could give um, earlier this year, uh, I was directing the MSK course at our school. We show the exams to the students and they can challenge the questions. 
and they have to provide evidence if something is wrong. And one of the student used a chat GBD, took a screenshot of it, and then submitted it as evidence that this question is wrong. Obviously, we have to, you know, educate the student about this. So it is happening. Students are using chat GPT for their oh, education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I just want to correct myself. I, I just think we don't need to train them on how to create images. They they need to be trained on how to use the, the, the models correctly. I couldn't agree more, Matt. <laughs> yes. Um, just yesterday, um, another example, I, I was just teaching the sympathetic system, and I wanted to find an image of Harry Potter that's fighting with the snake, emphasizing the sympathetic system, and the chat GPT would not generate the image because the chat GPT knew Harry, Harry Potter was copyrighted. And they were able to incorporate that. Uh, and I was I, I was applauding that for that. And I think there should be a way we should be able to do for human generated images, something of that nature. Um, and my question is like, so who would take lead with this and work with these you know, AI models so that if, if somebody asks, generate this with this image, um, what images are being used? And is there any consent from the people whose images are on the internet on which the AI is being trained on? That would need to be the publishers, right? Um, if they use uh, anatomical images from previous publications. I wouldn't know, but then the problem is we have so many uh, uh, pirate copies of just about every atlas floating around the, the net already. Uh, I mean, it's it's a real problem. I have a question, you know, from a financial point of view, Elizabeth's here from the Caribbean, as well as a colleague where resources are not so always available in places to get cadavers you know, and thinking about the students and ethical considerations where they're getting specimens from. I went to a Caribbean school recently and they only had specimens, not full cadavers. And I'm just wondering about that in less resourced areas, you know, everywhere in the world, what is the next best step for people and is AI the answer? Because we are resource in, you know, you're in Boston, I'm here. In New York, we have resources. What's the answer in less resource places? Well, I think that... Could you progress the slide so our librarian could quickly go? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I, I would say it depends. It's it's not so much the resources, but you, you make... You, it's the attitude that you take with what you have. Uh, and even if you had only... Uh, images or even AI images. Well, I'm, the problem is even with the with the apps, they're simply not anatomically accurate. I would go back to the la la last edition of the latest atlas that you know that is halfway decently accurate. Um, but then always remind everyone of the history of these images, that these images came from human beings, right? Um, with AI, that's that's even more removed. Might be more difficult, but it's the attitude that that as an educator you bring to the anatomy learning space. Uh -huh. Anybody else want to comment on that? Oh, let let me do the bibliometrics quickly. I'm sorry, Le Leanne, you're there. Go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Leanna Sager. I'm the scholarly publications librarian for both the School of Medicine and the Health System. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the bibliometrics around these articles and touch on traditional metrics like the citation and download count, um, as well as alt metrics, which focus on how the articles are being shared in both media and social media outlets. Um, all of these numbers are from the Dimensions database and the journal article, um, the journal's website. So both of these articles are about a year old, and unsurprisingly, because AI is such a hot topic, they've both received a fair amount of attention. Um, the Ethical Concerns article has already been cited six times in both anatomical science education and other medical education journals, which is a much higher number of citations than similar articles of its age. Um, it's also been mentioned in six posts by, by five different users on X, which is formerly Twitter, and has been saved in Mendeley 44 times. Um, Mendeley is a citation manager, and and when someone, someone downloads um, a reference to Mendeley is an indication that they're going to read it and potentially use it as part of their own research going forward. 
Um, also, the full text of the article has been downloaded 1,890 times from the Wiley Online Library, so a lot of people yeah. are reading it. The letter to the editor has been cited once so far, and the full text has been downloaded 333 times. You can advance the slide, please. Um, it's also gotten a fair amount of attention on X, has been shared seven times, and has been saved once on Mendeley. Okay, thank you. Thank and the last slide, could you put that up? We're just finishing out. It's one o'clock. There, you will get a survey. I um, who's here? I I don't have access to cut and place the survey into the um, box, so we we'll, won't be able to do that. Um, but certainly, uh, you will get a survey. I, this talk was phenomenal. It's eye opening for me, at least, and it's so good to think about these things as a group of educators. And I. Thank you all for coming. My next talk, very different, but it doesn't involve AI. Let's talk about it. It's also from Boston. I do have a little, I, I don't, it just happens they're both from Boston. It has nothing to do with um, anything with me. And this was a great article published in Academic Medicine, Introducing the Tiny Talks Curriculum, a Paradigm for Short Chalk Talks. This is a really important way of educating learners, faculty, students, everyone. Um, so I'm very excited to have, and I'm trying to use the original author articles as much as possible. This is a new trend for me. And I will have a dis I will be the discussant for this article. And um, I appreciate when the first authors come and I have to thank Sabine and Dr. Hill and Sabine Hildebrandt, Dr. Hildebrandt for their participation today. And um, joining us as first authors of their articles. Any final goodbyes? And Leanna, you're terrific. You put the eval form in the chat. You could all grab it and you will get a copy of this gorgeous PowerPoint and as well as um, a request to do the evaluation. And we had a great attendance today. So I'm very, very proud of um, everybody being interested in this topic. And